right so welcome back to the tap fight Char podcast and youtube channel today i'm joined by the fabulous sharon at livermore sharon is from domestic abuse education and she's doing some amazing things to raise awareness about domestic abuse in general and obviously to businesses as well so sharon welcome to the podcast thank you thank you very much for having me oh you're welcome so let's kind of start off um and just get straight into things. Can you tell us a little bit about how you became um, somebody who wants to raise awareness about domestic abuse? Yeah, absolutely. So um, seven years ago, I came extremely close to to losing my life and becoming a statistic of domestic abuse. I'd lived with my perpetrator for a number of years. He was my husband and I experienced um, physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, and I really lost myself. So I met him when I was on um, a sales course. I work in recruitment now um, as alongside the domestic abuse education that I do. And I was working in recruitment at the time. So as you can imagine, it's a role where you're in a sales role. Um, I met him on a sales course. So he was you know, larger than life. He was the, the kind person that was pouring water for everybody. And um, yeah, I thought this 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 man is, is really nice. Uh, I really fell for him quite quickly. And over time, I think it just became apparent um, that there were some red flags in the relationship, maybe ones initially that I, I kind of shied away from, but it we really took a turn when we got married. So it started from that point when we got married um, and it just got worse and worse to the point where I, I didn't know who I was. I know that sounds really silly, but I didn't know who Sharon was. I didn't wear the clothes that I wanted to. I didn't listen to the music I wanted to. I wasn't able to see friends, family, and, and work was my only escape. And it, it got to the point where I just didn't know where else to turn. And eventually I found the courage to, to just say no enough and, and leave him. Um, and at which point that's when I didn't realize, what I do realize now is that you're most in danger when you leave a relationship. Mm -hmm. And um, what he did was um, I'd left the relationship He'd spent a number of days plotting to to take my life. He'd um, angle grinded through through my house, so through my door. It was my house, um, so he'd angle grinded through the back door. He had gone in and taken um, my spare car key. It was November, so it was dark. I'd been at work. I came out to to the car um, and walked across the dark car park. Um, ongoing joke with my then office manager because her car was slightly older than mine mine was a newer car you know what it's like when cars get steamed up so uh, um, I always used to start my engine and be able to drive off a couple of minutes before her but that day she drove off while I was sitting in my car and um, I don't know whether I call it a sixth sense I think it was definitely someone there was a force there that was with me I like to believe on that day because I then realized quite quickly something wasn't right but I wasn't sure what so I looked behind me as you do and thought he's not there he's not sitting in the car don't be ridiculous these things don't happen um and then I smell aftershave and at that point I thought hang on no that this just isn't right so I put my hand behind me in the footwell behind my behind my seat and I felt my picnic blanket that was normally in the boot because I have OCD so very much um know where things are in life and I'm still the same to this day and um, so I got out of the car walked around to the boot and flipped the boot up and he was lying in my boot um with knives cable ties what he'd done was loosened and um, because it was a hatchback he'd loosened the seats so his plan was when I drove off was to come through and then the rest I don't know about obviously in court they know what his plan was was but they didn't ever want me to to know so I can't relive what didn't happen um Fortunately, I was able to run and one of my colleagues at the time came out and two other gentlemen from another business. Um, he did get hold of me, but I managed to go down and protect my head and, and my chest area. Um, and like I say, fortunately, there was people there. So then he fled off in my car. But in all honesty, if I'd have driven off in the car, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so I'm extremely fortunate to still have the voice that I have. And I choose to use that voice to campaign for those that either have lost their voice due to domestic abuse or are having their voice hidden at the moment and aren't able to reach out and get the help they need. Um, and I do appreciate my story is, um, it is quite a harrowing one and it does touch people in different ways, but it is my reality. That is what happened to me. And I think it's really important that people and businesses understand the difference that, that they can make by just starting those conversations and, and also allowing people to get help before they've left the relationship because as I said going back to that if if the business I worked for at the time 
had been educated or I was educated, um, I wouldn't have put myself in that position. I would have probably reached out to, to women's aid. Um, and obviously there was men's aid in different charities as well. Um, but to get the support that I needed before putting myself in such a vulnerable position. Um, but yeah, so that that's why I do what I do, if that gives you a bit more of an insight. It does. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I think I'm really confident okay. every time you relive that, that must be mm -hmm. harrowing, but thank you. Really appreciate yeah. that. So you, you kind of touched on my next question a little bit already. So what things can businesses do to help support people who are going through um, situations where there's domestic abuse? Yeah, absolutely. I think the hard thing is businesses don't always realise. They think what happens in a marital home isn't their business, but domestic abuse is everyone's business. And um, the well-being of, of employees is a business's job to make sure that they're OK in all different forms. And domestic abuse is one of those. Um, there were so many things that businesses can do. First of all is being educated, because until you understand what domestic abuse actually is, it's really hard to know how to respond. So understanding the forms of abuse. Um, so again, these are the things that I, I talk through on a daily basis with businesses, but understanding that it isn't just the physical side, it's the economic abuse as well. It's the, the controlling behavior, the isolation, it's the using the children. There's so many different aspects. Um, once the business is then educated, it's knowing how to see the signs in the workplace and what signs to look out for. So there will be people that everyone shows the different signs. But again, just to give you some examples of signs, and I'll use one that I used to do, was I had to be home on time. If I was five minutes late, I'd be accused of um, having an affair, speaking to somebody, all of these ridiculous things. But it was a, almost it was a control mechanism to then start an argument. So I had to be home on time. So working in recruitment um, and even that, you know, now I love a conversation. I could spend an hour on the phone to someone I've just met talking about what I did at the weekend. And I would be the same in the workplace throughout the day. But then if the phone went at 25 past five, I would panic. I'd be like, oh, the phone's gone and do everything I can to get that person off the phone. So I'd be scribbling notes and I'll call you back tomorrow, I'll call you back tomorrow. Completely different behavior to what I was doing in the day. And mm -hmm. if the people around me had have been educated, they would have potentially picked up on signs or felt comfortable enough to say, hold on, is everything okay? Um, but there's so many different signs that people can portray in the workplace. Um, the biggest thing a business can do is create a safe space. Now that is a lot to ask. It doesn't cost money for a business to create a safe space. But for example, if um, if you were working for me and you came to me and said, look, I, I think I'm experiencing abuse, this is what's happened. The businesses can't save people and the managers can't save people. What they can do is create um, an area that's safe so where they're away from the perpetrator because obviously when you're at work unless you work with them and I do appreciate that does happen um, but if you work away from your perpetrator you can create a safe space you can start that conversation and you can call in the external support that have got the relevant qualifications and understanding to give them opportunity to think about their situation and what their next step can be um, but on top of that with other things that businesses can do if someone comes forward and says they've been abused, take the perpetrator off as the next of kin on their HR records. Because if something happens legally, you've got to report it to the next of kin if it's the perpetrator. So that, again, I know it's time, but it doesn't cost a lot of money. If they've got a mobile phone that they're being harassed on in the workplace, can you change their number? Now, I've just done a SIM only deal for one of my team because they've come to the end of their thing, um, their, their contract. And it was, I think it's like five or six pound a month. So can you give them a new number? Um, so that they don't get harassed. Um, if they're working on reception, for example, or they're face, you know, client facing in the business, is there a way that they don't have to be in that position? They can still answer the phone, but maybe you can move them to the back office. Mm -hmm. um, flexible working, if they're having their wages paid into the perpetrator's account because they're being economically abused, straight away, do you know how to do that? Do you, can you help them set up their own bank account? Um, mm -hmm. So again, I'm throwing a few things and I'm aware I'm throwing lots of stuff at you, um, but that's just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of those things don't cost money, but they can make a huge difference to somebody's life and wellbeing. Mm, it's just kind of being a lot more vigilant really by the sounds of it, because little things like yeah. the bank account, you wouldn't necessarily attribute yeah. to somebody having a bad time, right? But actually it makes perfect Absolutely. Sense. We'll yeah that. because they've got the control if someone uh, I'm, again I'm not saying that that's always the way because I've got friends that are more than happy to have their money paid into their partner's account because they know that that's not their uh, their forte and they're quite happy to do that is when these things happen and they're not consented um so if there is someone that's having wages paid into um, a different account 
can you ask that question and just to say, look, you know, we've noticed this. We just want to make sure that everything's okay at home because this can be a sign of um, economic abuse. But if you're happy, that's fine. But we just want to make you aware that it is one of our checklists, you know. But it's if you're educated on abuse, I think it's easier to then start that conversation and how to start the conversation. Um, so there is there's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of people's lives that will be saved and changed if businesses do realise that there is so much that they can do. Mm. And what do you think businesses can do to raise awareness of just, you know, all the little things that you just said there? How can they go about educating kind of everyone within the organisation, really, so yep. that there are lots of different eyes to help people? Absolutely. So the education piece that I do, um, I often get asked, um, well, we'll get our manager, you know, our managers will come, our team leaders will come. And I say, no, you need everyone to come because it is the person that's sitting next to that person that will see the difference it's not necessarily the manager of the department that will notice their changes in behavior so for me personally i do believe that everyone in a business should be educated i do appreciate that can be quite hard um i educated a, a very large business a couple of months ago and they actually recorded my session which they've then put onto their internet and they've sent out for people to view so to try and get as much reach as possible but ultimately um i suppose the worst case scenario from educating a business is that it is just the senior management but then they work with their hr team to implement it further down um mm. and i think it, it's just so important that everyone has the opportunity to to be educated on it um, mm. The things that I work with businesses on as well is once they've had education is getting a policy in place. Obviously, you know, working in HR, um, that policies are really key to um, everyone understanding what where the limitations are and what they can do. So having that policy, implementing a policy is really important, um, but rolling it out as well. And part of an induction, obviously, I work in recruitment. So if... Um, there's an onboarding this should be part of the onboarding they should know what policies are there and that's not just domestic abuse that's have they got a mental health policy um you know have they got um hybrid working policy all of these things they need to be made aware of and it shouldn't just be a tick box exercise of we've had our education we've got a policy it is that continual learning and talking about it in team meetings having speakers go in and share their um, lived experience and continuing with that journey and that could even be potentially working with someone like yourself an HR consultant to make sure that that does continue to happen mm -hmm. um because yeah policies are only good if they're if they're used yeah can you yeah. <laughs> Tell us a bit more work about, oh, sorry, not work, work. Tell us a bit more about the work that you've been doing with policies. So I know you've got Sharon's policy, and I think that's such an amazing initiative. Can you tell us yeah. a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, Sharon's policy, unique name, named after me, <laughs> um, was uh, was put together actually during COVID. Um, because what I realised from the businesses that I was educating, they were saying, this is great. We now feel that, you know, we have got a better understanding of abuse, but what do we do next? And my thing was, you, you need a policy, um, but policies cost money. So that was a stopping point for a lot of businesses. So I worked with and collaborated um, with a number of people. So there was the Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse, the DA Alliance, HR Depth and myself um, across the UK, um, where we came together and put this policy together. So what it looks like is there's two documents. There is the official policy documents, which um, have been legally checked by Hogan Lovells. They're a global law firm. So that anyone who takes it knows that it is a legal policy. It's reviewed annually as well. Um, we're currently going through its second annual review. Um, but we, we do that to make sure that we are still in line with legislation. And then the, what I believe is the most important bit is the guidance notes. So the guidance notes are there for any size business to work with to understand how they um, respond to um, domestic abuse, they record, they refer, and um, they start those conversations, um, and then also what they can do. So I totally appreciate there are there are some companies I know that have a like a five thousand pound flea fund for each person that comes forward to get out of their situation. I couldn't do that in my business. I'm too small to do that. So it's really understanding that. Any business of any size can do something, but this the guidance notes are there to help them almost create their own guidance notes, it's a template for them to know what they can do in their own business. Um, and it, it does work. It works. Um, I've had people, um, King's College in Cambridge, for example, they use Sharon's policy. Um, Channel 4 have used channels, um, channels, Sharon's policy, not Channel 4's policy, um, to help them um, write theirs. 
But for me, it's really just, it's there so that there is no excuse for a business not to be able to understand what mm -hmm. they can do. And I do work with those businesses on how to embed the policy. Um, and I do encourage them if they've got HR internal people to work with them, if they've got an HR consultant to work with their HR consultant as well um, to embed that policy. But it sounds really silly. It's such an easy thing to do. Yes, it took a lot of hours and a lot of time and it still does for the reviews. But those hours have already saved a lot of people's lives. And we know that. So um, when you look at it like that, that one small thing that a business can do, um, and of course it takes time to you know work out how that policy will work for you as a business, make sure that you've rolled it out and those things. But ultimately we're talking about saving people's lives. Mm, I think that's a fantastic resource. Um, I think the fact that it's kind of legally accredited for want of a better term is- Absolutely, is yeah. Cool. Awesome. So you started talking about kind of different um, touch points and places that we could potentially signpost people to. Are there yeah. any other kind of free resources that um, business owners should be aware of when it comes to supporting someone going through domestic abuse? Yeah, absolutely. The, the biggest thing is working out what's in your local area. Um, and so on the guidance notes, we have a really huge list of um, people that you can reach out to. Um mm -hmm. But it comes down to what's in your area as well. So we know that obviously there's women's aid, which are national, there's men's aid, but it's looking um, at your local charities, also the, the specialist charities as well. So if you've got people from different genders, different cultures, they may need different types of support potentially, or people that have an understanding of what they're potentially going through. There's a lot of charities that specialise in different areas, shall we say. Um, the other thing, to be aware of is a fabulous app it's called the bright sky app um and it you can put in your postcode and it tells you what's in your area and um, it helps you understand about um what abuse is and it's an educational tool that looks like a weather app so i know there are businesses that have actually downloaded it onto each of their company mobile phones as standard so it's there um mm. and that has it has been really, really useful. Um, but I think, you know, if you're looking for an app, that's the app. Um, if you're looking for people to reach out to, it is looking and creating that list that works for you. But there are so many people in, that are doing good. I'm also partnered with a charity, um, Surviving Economic Abuse. They specialise in, obviously, the economic abuse side, and they run training courses just on that. And um, I'm partnered with another um, charity that, do child to parent abuse so there are so many different types of abuse um as well uh, are out there but I think for me it's kind of starting that conversation with people I go in and do the initial education um I you know get them thinking about it and then work with them to see if there are areas they want to learn more on but it isn't how do I put it it's not rocket science it's a process it's a policy and it's being educated um mm -hmm. and then continuing that work um, and if every business did that, I mean, my mission is that every business in the UK um, has a domestic abuse policy in place. It's a huge thing to take on. Um, but every business that I can educate or help with their policy, it's, it's a good, good job done. Mm, no, I completely agree. And I guess building on that then, how can businesses work with you? Can you tell us a little bit about what you do to support businesses and help raise awareness? I mean, you've given us a hell of a lot in terms of how you do that. But yeah. <laughs> if I want to work with you, what does that look like? Yeah, so if business wanted to work with me, um, what I like to do initially is point them in the direction of my website, which is domesticabuseeducation.co.uk, because that gives them an overview and understanding who I am. Um, so there's videos on there. There's bits about what my presentation involves, Sharon's policy, etc. But ultimately, what it looks like is it's a presentation that I give. Now, I do these virtually. Um, I do them in person. I love doing them in person because I think you do get a different level of response. Um that would be my preference, but um, I've done them virtually across the UK and they can be tailored to however many people. I don't mind if I'm presenting to one person or 10,000 people. Um, and what it looks like is it's a presentation that talks through the forms of abuse, um, some statistics, as we said, around the different genders, the different cultures, et cetera, um, how to start a conversation which is really important, the signs to look for in the workplace and barriers to disclosing, because that's often something that people find hard to understand as well, how to signpost and Sharon's policy. So what I don't want to do is that overload people, but anyone who has the, the education will come away with a much better understanding to then build on. Um, and I have a Q&A session at the end, which is open for as long as needed. 
some of my Q and A sessions have been five minutes. There was one that I was on, and it was for an hour and a half. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And <laughs> um, but the way I look at it is, if if there are questions that people want to know about my my particular experience, my particular journey, um, or just domestic abuse in general, then any question is a good question. So, um, that's kind of the first part. Following on from that, I then work with businesses uh, on a one to one basis. More so at that point with the HR team um, or the the directors, shall we say, the managers about how to implement the policy and get the best out of it. So the but the the one that the I suppose makes the most difference initially, obviously, is the education piece because I've had people that have listened and then reached out to me afterwards and said I didn't even know I was in an abusive relationship mm. until I listened to the to the education and I'm like exactly. Sometimes people don't know. Sometimes mm. people will choose to put a blind eye to it because they don't feel that they'd be supported. And I know there are people that have come forward after this session that I give to their businesses that have then helped them get out of the out of the relationship that they've been in. Yeah, I think that's incredibly powerful, what you say. Um, so how can people get in contact with you? So what I'll do is I'll make sure there are yeah. links to all of the resources that you've talked about um, in wherever you're um, consuming this piece of data. Um, yeah. <laughs> people want to um get hold of you and um, and work with you what's the best yeah. way to do that um so people can either email me and my email address is sharon at domestic abuse education.co.uk um, or they can call me my phone number is 01223 um, and i'm very happy to answer questions and um, have a have a telephone call set up a zoom um and just go from there because the more people that reach out the more people that we can potentially like I say change lives save lives so but we need to work together to do this and this is what I was saying to you before we actually came on the podcast and um, it is about collaborating it's, pe- it's collaborating with people like yourself it's collaborating with businesses and um, we can't do this on our own so um, it is it is about working together to really make those changes and make changes that are not just for the short term but for the long term as well yeah you're so inspiring Sharon <laughs> So you really are the fact that you're happy to come here and talk about what um what you've been through, which must be incredibly hard, and that you're dedicating all this time and energy to what you're doing, I think is amazing. So I'm very honored. Thank you. Oh, thank you very oh much. no, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you think would be useful for us to go through, or do we feel like we've covered all of the major bases? No, I think I think I have. I think if I if there was one person listening today, um that may potentially be going through abuse as well um do do reach out to people because there are people out there that will help you um and be kind to yourself I think you know when I went through it I I at the time I blamed myself for a lot of it it was like he's doing this because I've done that but Mm. actually that's not the case if you're in a position where you're not happy and it's not a healthy relationship then it's not your fault and there are people out there that will help you um so definitely reach out get the support you need um and yeah, find your happy place, find your happy life. It's not easy, but um, I think once you once you get past that stage of reaching out and knowing that people are there, um, it makes your journey so much easier. Amazing stuff. Well, as I say, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out, Sharon, make sure you do. Thanks for your time. Yes, please do. Thank you.